You're listening to the Plastic Shift Podcast. Welcome to the Plastic Shift Podcast. I'm Eileen Farnood, one of the students of the Plastic Shift, and I'm reaching out to several experts working to solve issues with plastic pollution. This podcast showcases unique perspectives on this problem to identify what its most important aspects are. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Walter Castelvetro, an Associate Professor of Polymer Chemistry at the Department of Chemistry and Industrial Chemistry at the University of Pisa, Italy. Adding to his research interests on advanced polymeric materials for specialized applications and on polymer modification for plastics recycling, in the last years he has become interested in some less understood issues about the environmental pollution by micro and nanoplastics. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me today. Just to get started, could you briefly introduce yourself and explain your research regarding how plastics can release harmful VOCs during degradation? Uh, Yes, I'm a polymer chemist. I work, I do research on plastic materials. And uh, only recently, let's say three, four years ago, I realized that this problem of uh, the pollution of uh, the oceans by plastics had become uh, a really serious issue and uh, was being discussed a lot uh, in the media, but also starting to be looked after uh, in the the research environment. And uh, of course, but starting from my my understanding of plastics, so polymers and uh, and plastics materials, I realized that uh, most of the research that's been had been going on until that time was uh, carried out by environmental scientists, biologists, only a few chemists, I would say. I'm a chemist for my studies. And uh, that meant that there was a very careful attention in understanding the environmental situation, but not as much in understanding the implications of having plastics in that kind of an environment. And plastics are, uh, it's not one thing, it's many, many different materials and uh, different materials that have different behavior depending on interactions with the environment. And uh, therefore, we started uh, thinking and looking at what were the, the holes in the information and the knowledge. There are still many, but at that time, I, w- I would say there were even more. And among them, there were uh, problems in understanding, or there was less understanding, let's say, about how important are the degradation processes of uh, plastics and how much material is there that nobody can see because it's too small. In the last couple of years, two, three years, this kind of information has started to come out from the scientific literature. But before, people would be worried mostly about or concerned about what you could see, you know, large plastic objects floating or on beaches, uh, which obviously are a problem, but on their own because they can be ingested, they can trap large animals. That amount of plastic that we can see, I was very well aware that it was just you know, the, the tip of the iceberg and even less than that compared to the amount of uh, plastic items and, and, and materials that are likely to have ended up in the oceans over the last, let's say, mostly 50 years. And so What was important was to find a way of, first of all, understanding, knowing how much material is and what kind of material and where. And by this kind of material, I mean the microscopic fractions. So fragments and materials that are produced as such as microscopic particles that are in the oceans. And when I say oceans, I mean actually, uh, you know, fresh waters, rivers, lakes, and eventually oceans, but also now in land and air, <clears throat> let's say mostly oceans, as oceans are likely to be the final sink of all these materials. So we started to work on this, on uh, methods to really measure how much microplastics uh, are there, okay? not, not just in waters, but also in, uh, in sediments, so the, at the bottom of the oceans or on the beaches, 
and in other complex, you know, difficult to deal with environmental matrices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know earlier you were mentioning how um, just like this general process of how plastics eventually degrade into microplastics and then that goes out into the oceans. And I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the reason why plastics degrade and also how they do so. Sure. Well, uh, people say plastics stay there for hundreds or even thousands of years, and that's not really the case. We all experience the fact that plastic items degrade over time when we use it, you no? Know? So, and that kind of degradation is typical of, of any organic material, biological material, but also uh, any, any kind of organic material. Paint in, in a painting degrades because it has organic binder and so on. So what is the main cause of uh, degradation for plastics? Well, that depends on the kind of plastics. What always works in terms of degradation is photooxidation. Photooxidation means a combined action of uh, sun, sunlight, so electromagnetic, uh, let's say, interaction with, with the material, and oxygen, atmospheric oxygen. So it's called together the photooxidation, which is a series of complex mechanisms which can result in a series of reactions that cause um, degradation of plastics. But not all plastics degrade at the same speed and in the same way. And the fact is that uh, the, the plastics that are more likely to quickly degrade by photooxidation are uh, the ones that are among the most used plastic or the most used uh, plastic materials, which are polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. So those plastics that are used a lot for packaging, for bottles, for wrapping plastics, for single use items in restaurants, when you go to a picnic and so on. Now, this kind of plastic, when they degrade, depending on which kind, so polyethylene and polypropylene, one way, polystyrene a little different, but essentially what they do, they start becoming brittle and they start to fragment, to lose pieces, okay? And these pieces can be larger ones, but eventually they become smaller and smaller and smaller. And by becoming smaller, they increase they, their surface area, okay? Because of course you have more edges and more surface that is available, is available for oxygen and for light. And that means that the, the degradation speeds up. And these plastics are also low density plastics. So when they end up in water, they float. And by floating, they stay available for oxygen and light. And so they further degrade, okay? And this degradation means, doesn't mean that it, the plastic disappears. It just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And by becoming smaller and smaller, it's more easily, for example, ingested by very small marine organisms, which are the base of the food chain. They could do a lot of other different, have a lot of other different interactions with uh, marine ecosystems, but we don't know a lot yet about this. Now, there are other types of plastics that are also, of course, used and that could also undergo photooxidation, but they are might, may be more likely to uh, degrade by hydrolytic processes, but it's, that's much, much uh, slower because these plastics are made to last. So plastic for the bottles of PET, for example, no, polyethylene terephthalate, nylons, which is a polyamide, and other plastic polycarbonates and so on. The volumes are smaller, but these plastics have also a different feature, which is very important. They are more dense than water. So they tend to sink. By sinking, they end up at the bottom of the rivers or lakes and, and seas. And their degradation is much, 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 much slower. Okay, so they can stay there really for a long time, which is a problem because they you know, generate a kind of a carpet underneath. But on the other hand, there are likely to be less dangers for uh, uh, marine life. But there is another problem uh, connected with, for example, PET and nylons, and mainly, not, not only, but mainly, 
because of the volume of the large amount of, of this kind of material, is that these kind of materials are used also for making textile fibers. And so textile fibers are small, very small you know, fibers that can, even if they're dense, they can stay afloat for a long time because of the currents, because of the movements of the, of the water. And they are so small that can also be ingested. Okay, so the larger items of bottle or PT does not degrade easily, and it's not a major problem for small, small organisms. But um, uh, textile fiber could be, because it can be ingested and then through the food chain going up you know, the ladder. So these are the different situations of different polymers. Do they stay up? They go down. Uh, even the, the poly, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene that stay afloat, actually when they become very small, they tend to be coated by a biofilm. So proteins and other uh, biological material that are attached to it by uh, organisms, marine organisms. And this makes particles, so microscopic particles or millimeter-like size particles become more dense until the, eventually they might also sink. But when they sink, they are small enough to be likely to interact with marine organisms, the ones that work at, at the bottom of the seas. And at the bottom of the seas, that's also a place where, for example, reproduction goes on. So these are delicate environments and, and they don't like uh, a lot disturbance. And this is, of course, kind of a disturbance. On top of that, this degradation does not cause only fragmentation of the polymers. It also causes change in the chemical composition of the polymer, of the plastic particle, particularly at the surface. And when you have a solid object, the interaction with the environment is mainly through the surface of the solid particle. So this change in the surface properties can also have effects through the interaction with, with, the, with the organisms, particularly if they are ingested by you know, filtering muscles and, uh, or filtering organisms that are at the, usually at the bottom of the seas rather than maybe uh, planktonic or other organisms in the water or, or in the surface waters and so on. So several problems that now we are starting to be quite aware of. We don't understand by saying we, I, of course, I, I mean uh, researchers throughout you know, the world. Uh, we don't quite understand very well what kind of damages they might or might not cause by interacting. Uh, it, it's possible that the damages are not as big as one could uh, fear because in most cases, the particles go through the intestinal tract of the animal and not necessarily they, they get absorbed. But still here there is another hole, something that we miss to, to understand and it's going to be very difficult to study, which is what happens to the micrometric particles when they keep becoming more and more degraded and they fragment further and they, they from micrometric, so one micron is one thousandth of a, of a millimeter, but they become nanometric. So nanometric means you know, another 10, 100, 1,000 times smaller. At that point, they can actually, they could be absorbed through the intestinal walls into the animal tissue. And we know almost nothing right now about the potential damage of this kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just said, like, we don't really know what the effects are going to be in terms of both like how it might harm one's health, how it might harm the environment. But I wanted to focus in on your research regarding how plastics can release volatile organic compounds. And I found that particularly interesting myself because I'm not too aware of what this process is like and why it happens and also what are the side effects of this occurring. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and whether these VOCs have the potential to harm someone's health or the surrounding environment. And I know that like a lot of the current impacts are still 
under research, but if you know anything that would be really interesting to hear. Sure. Well, this was something that came out uh, from our research and from my interaction with colleagues uh, that are more in, into analytical chemistry. And they, they were, it was interesting because actually they were working on human breath to detect very small amount of molecules that uh, are, could be the markers of pathological processes. So we said, well, you know, we know that polymers degrade and that by degrading, uh, degradation of polymer means that there is a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction can be a change in the molecular structure, but we know that's been known for a while, that also there is fragmentation of the polymer chain. A polymer is a macromolecule, so it has a very high molecular weight. Uh, it's, it's a solid, let's say. But if you start cutting the molecule into small pieces, these small pieces are small molecules, and small molecules can do a couple of things. They can be volatile, so they come out. And if the material is in water, they can be leached out, so they can dissolve in water. And these molecules that are generated by the fragmentation, which is usually a photooxidative process, can be hydrolytic, but the most common is, as I said before, is photooxidation. They are oxidized. I'm not going into the chemistry of that, but Oxidized means that there are molecules that are generated which ha have reactive groups. They can be derivatives of a formic acid, let's say, uh, derivatives of acids or, or several molecules that are small, volatile, and reactive, okay? Being reactive is a double face issue. On one side, if it's reactive, that means it doesn't last long. It will react with something. Okay, so it will not be reactive for a long time. And uh, on the other hand, of course, if it's reactive, if by reacting with something, if th that something is an organism, that can cause problem. So, uh, but for sure, plastics do fragment. By fragmenting, there is a combination of a microscopic mechanism that we can see. Also, each Fragmentation means that there are a lot of smaller molecular fragments that have been released. So, of course, the amount that it locally is, is released is not a lot. It's, it's, it, there are molecules. Let's say if you want to give a, a try or anybody wants to give a try, get a piece of old plastic material, crush it and put it into a closed bottle, closed vial, whatever. Close the lid, leave it there for a little while. And then you open it and you smell, and you will smell something that is not just air, okay? It's the release of these molecules that are continuously released because plastics continuously degrades, okay? So again, these can be really nasty molecules sometimes, and that's why possibly, although there is not yet direct evidence, but we know already that uh, there are uh, problems with uh, uh, disruption of endocrine systems in the small uh, marine organisms. Uh, there are some evidences that uh, the growth, uh, reproduction and growth of plants and animals are somehow affected by plastics. And that's probably because of microplastics, and that's even more likely to be not because of the solid material, but because of these molecules that are released as a consequence of plastic degradation or microplastic degradation. That's, that's our, I'm convinced of that. Our paper was published this year and was uh, really something new. Even the journal that published the paper was very pleased to, to have kind of new information which was not, was not really that much understood and available before. So we're starting to work on that. I'm, I'm sure that there will be more coming out in the coming uh, years, because this is really, this could be uh, an issue, okay? If a small animal ingests plastic material, uh, like let's say uh, microplastic particles, the effect of this ingestion can be um, due to the fact that the molecules are released and these molecules can interact. And also, possibly, but I would say uh, as a 
minor effect the interaction of the surface of the particle, which is reactive as well. And they're usually more densely concentrated at the surface of the particle. And that's the surface of particles that interact with the organism. That's, that's our perception of the problem right now. We don't have that much evidence of the effects, but we do have uh, very much evidence and we are collecting that uh, about the amount of uh, plastic that is of a, sorry of uh, small molecules that are released mm -hmm. so for the last point if you have a, a plastic object that is stranded on a beach it doesn't last a thousand years it will fragment into smaller particles after maybe a year or so you won't see it anymore it will be there smaller fragments and can still be collected and measured you leave it there for even longer, uh, eventually, maybe in uh, 10 years or now, it will not be there anymore because it will keep fragmenting into smaller and smaller particles until the molecular fragments will be most of it and it will be released as, as molecules. Uh, there is a possibility that this kind of uh, uh, highly degraded plastic surfaces or microplastic surfaces get biodegraded by microorganisms because when it, the, the, the polymer is so much uh, transformed into something chemically different because of degradation, it, it tends to become more easily uh, biodegraded by microorganisms, right? So that's what my perception of what happens over time to plastic items that are on the surface, okay? So they can, they're accessible to light and oxygen. Again, not all plastic atoms work that way. Uh, there are some materials that are more resistant to degradation. Uh, one of them is PET, so polyethylene terephthalate from, uh, used for bottles and for polyester fibers, uh, textile fibers, uh, nylons, and, uh, and other materials are more resistant to degradation. But the world production of plastics that are mismanaged, let's say, and they end up in the environment, is a large, a very large fraction of these uh, plastic items is made out of uh, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, so polyolefins all together, and polystyrene. And these plastics, they do degrade quite effectively, let's say. Mm -hmm. All right, well, one more question before we wrap things up, but just in general, both related to this issue of plastics degrading and also the fact that these plastics are releasing volatile organic compounds. I was wondering what you think would be the best next steps for solving these problems. Well, um, it really is a good question and a difficult question to answer. Um, and because it is not really, it's not realistic to expect that plastics will not be produced as much as they are now. The production will most likely increase over the years. And the, the point is that it will increase its, its consumption, let's say, mostly in those countries that are less effective right now and probably there will still be for, for a while in um, managing wastes. So China is certainly changing its approach to waste management, uh, but other countries there have large and growing and developing population that are not. And in fact, what we know is that uh, the large majority of the plastic pollution comes from these kind of these countries so uh, what can be done we certainly can do something on in our countries uh, to improve the quality of the waters which could be for example looking for ways to reduce the release of uh, textile fibers into laundry waters you know waste waters uh, to capture this kind of microfibers, uh, uh, for example, uh, after the wastewater treatment plants, 
no? uh, when the waters, uh, the purified, so-called purified waters are released, that they still contain microplastics. Uh, of course, we can do some for citizen science and 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 raise awareness about the people, and also have and this is this is already happening, have regulations that limit the type and amount of single-use uh, plastic items when they are not necessary. There are many many uh, you know situations and when many applications in, in packaging, particularly in which. It would be really a shame if the plastic packaging would be placed because uh, it, it is really, uh, if well managed, it's, it's uh, advantages for the environment. Uh, but, you know, mismanagement is the real problem. Uh, mismanagement is the real problem for larger plastic items. So we need to understand that uh, plastic should be essentially uh, not thrown out should be recycled and that's the main point of course we can do something to somehow start some kind of remediation environmental remediation but it's unlikely to be uh, uh, really very effective for what for the damage that's already done because it's you know there's too much to remediate there are some things that have been done for example uh, i'm i'm in italy i live in italy and it, and they they're, they've started to have uh, the fishermen not throw back the plastics that they they catch into the uh, water, but to collect it and take it back to the shore, to the harbor, and before they they would give them a fine because they they would uh, you know take trash into uh, the harbor. Now they they're they're getting praised because of that. You know? So that's useful because, of course, they, they kind of calm the, the bottom of the sea, and so they collect larger uh, pieces. But the smaller ones, uh, they're there. <laughs> they won't be re uh, removed anymore. So we can, what we can do, actually, is try to reduce, minimize the amount of plastics that enter the oceans, and they enter the oceans mainly through the uh, activities, the human activities, inland okay and then through the weavers and so on they, they end up in the ocean so we have to be more aware of what we're doing and of the damage that we can create mm -hmm. yeah well that policy that you mentioned in italy is quite nice i haven't heard of anything like that before so that's quite interesting as well um but i just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to have this conversation with me I really appreciate everything that you've shared. And before we finish things off completely, if anyone has, or if any of our listeners have any questions or if they want to get in touch with you, um, how would they go about doing that online? Um, well, by you have my email, for example. I'm not that much social active. I have uh, my accounts on, on you know, Facebook and, and all that stuff. But... I'm not very active in that, so the best way would be to email me, and I'll be happy to interact and, and uh, answer to questions, sure. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, okay. well, thank you so much. Thank you to you for having me, and I uh, hope that will be helpful and, and useful for people who listen to that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>